Welcome to my world. Two escargot, pate, frise, two green salads. Okay, man, it's not here. Lamb chop, steak free. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two faux filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. And now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I am looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. There are 8 million people in New York City. Every day they have to eat, and someone has to cook for them. My name is Tony Bourdain. I've been in the restaurant business for 28 years. About 20 of those as a chef. I started as a dishwasher, I've been a line cook, a prep drone. A good cook, a bad cook, a good person and a bad person. I'm a changed person from the way I used to be. And every morning, starting at 8 a.m., I'm the executive chef at Leal Brasserie in New York City. In New York, the chances of success in a restaurant business, well, the odds are stacked against you. My, uh, my personal logo, spanking new chef's whites. Uh, you know, this is the big leagues. These are my babies, right here. I have suspicions. I saw a suckling pig being tied up the other day. I suspect I'll need this. It's a very capricious, uh, very fickle, very fast-moving public, very sophisticated. Uh, they demand not only the best, but different. Oh, isn't it cute? What drives you to do this every single day? I don't know. You love it. Seeing how many things you can make at the same time. Over here, I'm working the beef for the braised dough of beef. Over here, we have tomato concasse working. Over there, sauce poivre reducing. And in here, our little friend, uh, the boned out baby pig. Maybe you recognize him from such films as Babe, Pig in the City, and Babe, The Revenge. Cooks have traditionally been slaves from Roman times up until the mid-1800s. So far, I've found that all line cooks share the same sense of being outsiders, degraded, beaten down, underappreciated. Many of us have a messy, dysfunctional, chaotic lives outside of the kitchen, but inside the kitchen, we have the only order, the only structure in our lives. What time were you supposed to be here today? Uh, 10.30. 10 10.30, what time is it now? 45. Do you own a watch? Should I buy you a watch? Well, that's Apparently you have some uh, problem telling time. Yeah, I think the removal of at least a digit, just to, to show that you recognize your, your transgressions. OK, maybe I'm busting Opie's chops, but when I was 17, I was sliding down the same slippery slope of insolence. The way I've lived my life, I am on bonus round now. I ran out of points a long time ago. I'd probably be scooping mashed potatoes in Attica right now if it wasn't for my first summer in Provincetown. Recently, I went back and confronted my shady past. Yeah, baby, summer 1974, Provincetown, Massachusetts. Salt air, sea breeze, promises of New England clam chowder, squid stew, Maine lobsters, local scallops. It's all that good New England seashore stuff. I stumbled into town a penniless 17-year-old without a clue what to do with my life. That's where my long and checkered career began, right, right there. Getting a job washing dishes to pay the rent, I was quickly impressed by the line cooks. I wanted to drink as much free liquor as they got. I wanted to as many waitresses as they did. I wanted to be able to steal whole sirloin scripts and load up my freezer with frozen shrimp just like they did. You know, it was exactly what you look for as a teenager. To walk into a bar with a posse of uh, smelly cooks around you and have the room uh, hush slightly. You were a tough guy. You could knock out 300 meals, stand in a hot kitchen, crank out fried fish and steamed lobsters for hordes of hungry tourists, and it was a ready-made excuse to behave badly in every other part of your life. I thought, boy, if this is the life that chefs lead, that looks pretty good to me. My first big break came from working the line at Ciro and Sal's Italian restaurant. Ciro and Sal serves all your favorite Italian standards, from fettuccine alfredo to asso buco. But with the added plus of their New England seashore location, they also serve a wide variety of fresh fish and seafood dishes, all cooked in the Italian way, of course. But nevertheless, I have my own personal favorite. Ah, I love Marsala. 
sauce. Veal marsala. Grazie. Marsala is a velvety meat sauce which gets its robust flavor from the Italian wine of the same name. An you know, old school veal dish, you know, I've seen it in a million Italian restaurants. Why did I order it? Because I thought it was very cool when I came here. They used to do this thing, they'd saute the veal in one pan. Then they deglaze the pan. But they would have three, sometimes three, sometimes four empty pans set on burners down the stove, preheated, super hot. So to quick reduce the sauce, they would go. And then quickly pour it from pan to pan, hissing and splattering as it would move from one pan to the other, cooking down ultra quick. It was a very flashy move. It impressed the hell out of me. It was a drug-addled 17-year-old could barely crack an egg. I came over here and worked besides a huge grill man who was really good at his job. Now, here's the thing. I believe that he is now the chef here. I'm afraid I'm going to go in the kitchen and say, oh, you little screw up. I got my <laughs> ass kicked in this kitchen so badly. So let's reenact this. The year was 1974, 75, yes, right? Yeah. Presumably, I'm supposed to be helping out. <laughs> and everybody's screaming. I don't even understand the names of these dishes. Like, what's the Nordic? What's the Mothal? Asaluko. What is that? I don't know. And so I remember just standing here just doing this thing, you know, like. <laughs> And of course, you're making all the right moves. You're pretty much secure at the far end and a little bit of the other. Yep. You're being way too nice. I was so useless. <laughs> I was so useless. I didn't see you did a great job. You're all right. I think you took care of it. <laughs> now, as I remember it, I burned myself, right? And I asked you for burn cream. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, suddenly, the noisiest kitchen in the world became the silentest kitchen in the world. And now look at you, the big time Jeff, huh? Well, in a lot of ways, I owe it all to you. If I hadn't been so utterly humiliated by my <laughs> uselessness that night, I mean, I could have ended up, you know, uh, sticking up liquor stores. Yeah. I mean, you know, you put me on the straight yeah. and narrow. If things go sour for me with all this TV nonsense, uh, I'll, I'll be looking for my fry job all back. Right, come on back. <laughs> now, what would I have become had I not become a, a cook? I'm sure tragedy would have ensued. In fact, if there's any part of me that's good and decent and organized, and exhibits the qualities that generally parents approve of. Strangely enough, I learned all of those, uh, all of those things in the restaurant business. At around noon at Leal, we always get a lunch rush. Good. Okay, guys, we have a steak with a muscle. Direct. In a restaurant kitchen, the day has a distinct rhythm. The major periods are the lunch and dinner rushes. Within each rush, there are smaller divisions of fast and slow as the dining room turns over. The adrenaline generator, I mean, apparently joggers get some sort of a kick like after they jog every day, they get hooked on it. It's much the same way. You get hooked on generating a few bursts of adrenaline like this every single day. The wannabes beware. This is no walk in the park. You better be at a high pitch for this. I lose my shit for one minute. These guys wait next to 30 minutes to get their food. No matter how good a job you know, we do today, we're going to have to do it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day and forever. One of the things that keeps me from crashing and burning is a firm foundation in the basement. I am classically trained in the sense that I went to uh, I went to the best cooking school in the country and was trained by a procession of very old school French, Austrian, Swiss, Italian, and German chefs. The world has changed a lot since those times. The school I went to has changed a lot. It's a whole different world up there. Everything is good, all caught up. Recently, I was invited back to my alma mater to visit with students and staff. CIA, the Culinary Institute of America. This is the Harvard and West Point of cooking schools, all rolled into one. Located on its own facility in upstate New York, this is a self-contained compound that offers a disciplined and exhaustive education in the culinary arts, as well as the restaurant business. My first stop is to visit the actual classroom where I did many of my kitchen exercises. How do you do, Chef? Nice to meet you. Out of courses. How do you do? Uh, I was in this kitchen in 1970. Five, I think, yes. Yeah. Right, do we have a quick lineup, please, ladies and gentlemen? So every morning, I start out class this way. This is the lineup. Mm -hmm. I greet every one of them individually, shake their hands, give them the inspection, make sure their shoes are shined, make sure their hats are on straight, the whole nine yards, get right. them geared up for their professional day. And uh, perhaps the class would like to uh, 
say a few words to our guest, our guest chef here, Mr. Anthony Bourdain. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Oh, thank you. Good to see you. This guy is definitely a food drill sergeant. He doesn't phase me. We had guys like him back when I attended CIA. What surprises me are the students. These aren't the farm boys, bedwetters, flunkouts, and criminal miscreants that attended CIA in 75. These students mean business. So I decided to lighten things up a bit. I'll confess something. Uh, I used to cheat in this class. I remember I used to have uh, six and a half hours to come up with a you know, strong stock. They should have given me a full pat down. I was smuggling in little packets of uh, miners' uh, chicken base. So. <laughs> Maybe uh, the x-ray machine will be in place you, tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, and, uh, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. I decided to drop into a class down the hall where they're actually learning how to make stocks. Chef, I'd um, like to get you started maybe with a uh, jacket and a hat. Uh, I could do that. As usual here. All right, got my coffee filter on. First time in 23 years. Don't quote me. To most people who even know what it is, stock may seem like a pretty simple or boring thing to focus on in a cooking school like this. But on the contrary, stock is the fundamental ingredient in a significant majority of soups, sauces, and recipes. Now what stocks are uh, coming out of this class today again? All right, we make chicken stock every day, we make a brown veal stock every day, we make a white beef stock every day. Stock is made by gently simmering the bones and meat of animals or fish, along with vegetables, spices, and occasionally wine. The first day we talk about uh, that this class focuses on these stocks and the importance of, of them. If you don't have a good stock, you're not going to have a good finished product, no. you're not going to have a good rice. Not a bad stock will ruin your, your finished product. You know, you've killed the thing in its crib already. You know, you see a lot of stock crimes out in the world. Unpeeled carrots, unpeeled onions, letting stocks get bitter, overboiling them. Well, there are a lot of things that can go wrong with stock. How many hours is that? Six hours. So the veal stock cooks six hours. All right, good. And the oven's on yet? Oh, no. Get those ovens on. You know, it's easy, to, especially when you're talking about stocks and basics, it's easy to start veering slowly off the course. What separates great chefs from, from decent chefs, the guys who never waver, you know, and, and are basically making stocks the right way their whole life, continuously and relentlessly. Chef, thank you so thank much. You. While so some things never seem to change, what is the, <laughs> the future of culinary school definitely has. You know, when I told my parents, Mom, Dad, I want to be a chef. Uh, and I want to go to cooking school, I want to go to the Culinary Institute of America. I mean, they were about as happy about that as if I'd announced at the dinner table, you know, Mom, Dad, I want to be an arsonist. Now, wealthy parents are cheerfully sending their kids off to culinary school and bragging about it as an honorable profession. That is at least until I get my hands on them when they graduate. Hey, maybe I should go and see the dean about a teaching position. As Leal kicks into the evening shift, I'm replaced at the saute station and switch over to expediter. And what does an expediter do? He makes sure that the food comes up at the same time and gets out to the right table at the right time. You got a calamari working. You're the best. Come on, Elvis, move. I want to smell hair burn. Being a chef is an all right brain. In fact, a large part of the job is managerial. Oh, no. Donde? Hold it. All right, throw out the olives. I want all new ones. There are only a few hours left in the day, but the dinner rush is always the toughest part. Volavant, endive salad, green salad, followed by two lamb chops, veal paillard, anglais, two faux filets, green salad, followed by filet. Oh, oh, see, this is ugly. Usually it's about this time that I start fantasizing about going postal on my dining room. Look at this dude. No butter, bear, no butter, no butter, but they want extra bearnaise. I mean, that's a, what the f is the matter with these stuttering f No butter. What the hell do you think bearnaise is? Bearnaise is like egg yolks and butter. The one thing that always keeps me from going over the edge is my fear and reverence for one man, a man who taught me everything I know about managing a kitchen. He's the man I like to call Bigfoot. Every now and again, I like to touch base with the master in order to keep myself properly aligned. Bigfoot is a legend in the Lower Manhattan restaurant business. This whole neighborhood is Bigfoot territory. He owned and ran three places that I know of, all within a few block area of here. The man has, shall we say, a reputation. He's the godfather. He rules his establishments with an iron fist. I haven't worked for the man in 10 years, but I've the guy's still screwing with my head. That's the kind of uh, management I like and admire. 
Bigfoot always had an uncanny ability of being aware of the most intimate details of everything happening in his restaurant. Time to see my longtime mentor, my original mentor, the man I refer to as Bigfoot. I think you should call me Mr. Bigfoot. Or Mr. Foot. Anytime anyone in the biz needs to self-reflect, they always value Bigfoot's counsel. Your Eminence, do sit down. Wendy, when did I walk in the door first into your uh, into your restaurant? Maybe we met in '76, '7. Generations of uh, of, uh, of bartenders, cooks, waiters, busboys, managers have uh, have gone through your various operations. What were my strengths and weaknesses as a line cook? <laughs> Yeah. In all honesty, the, the people that succeeded the most in any of my organizations, I think you would characterize as real smart guys. I was looking for an answer, like, your soups were really good, tell me. <laughs> no, your soups were not so good, memory serves. <laughs> and you were fun to have around all the time. So I wouldn't be the go-to guy if you were looking for, you know, some spectacular uh, new, uh, you know, to break new ground in cuisine. I probably wouldn't be the guy you call. That thought has never <laughs> crossed my mind. <laughs> But you happen to have one really staggeringly talented yep. cook under your roof for a while who helped me a lot in later years. Yeah, um, he, he certainly could. He certainly could put the food on the plate. He yeah. didn't have a clue about the management, which is, as you know, as much a part of the chef's job as the food is. I, I can't look back and say to you that it was your soups or anything like that. I can't remember back for that far. But the thing that springs to mind first and foremost was the fact that you always took care of it. You have to be able to depend upon your people. The like all wise mentors, Bigfoot always knows how to level criticism constructively. He always seemed to know just what you were thinking. I wonder if all those stories were true. I can't disclose that. Okay, this is getting creepy. I'm getting out of here. Hey, thanks very much for your time. It's always good to see you when you're back around. You'll stop in and say hello. Always. See ya. The one thing I definitely learned from Bigfoot is that management skills in the kitchen are key. It's ironic when you consider how screwed up I used to be. Oh yeah, and the ability to cook, that would be a good thing also. But I would say it comes after. I mean, the, the other qualities are more important, and this is something that most people miss. Of course, a good chef also knows when to give a little slack, <laughs> especially to himself. I'm committing a felony. Hey, don't look. <laughs> After 14 hours at Leal, my day is winding down. The dinner rush is at its final death throes. Everything's good? Oh, yeah, yeah. Pace is fine? Yeah, so far. Good. So far. After this, no problem, nothing, right? At the end of the day, when your energy starts to fail, it's less about the individual than the group camaraderie that pulls you down that final stretch. Listen, it's really, really important to me that you have a good night. Thank you. Because I care about me you. Too. Finally, my shift comes to an end. The Earth has completed two-thirds of a revolution. But do I want to go home? Not on your life. Eh, maybe a couple of cocktails, talk to some other chefs. <laughs> well, bye, guys. Okay, I see you. Most of the time, I just grab a few beers with the crew. But once or twice a week, well, I want to go where everybody knows my name. Bellevue Bar. The owner of Bellevue Bar is my really good friend, Tracy Westmoreland. This is the back room, the sort of secret back room of Bellevue Bar. You always get a good crowd of people who are in the industry, and they always know they can drop by one of Tracy's places later and I get treated really, really well and behave really, really badly. <laughs> you never know who'll show up, but tonight's cast of characters includes Duny Parent, owner of Nobu, Philippe Roussel, chef at Park Bistro, and Scott Bryan, chef at Veritas. What we all seem to want to do after work is hang out with other people from the restaurant business uh, who just did what we did and talk shop. You know, you need to hang around with, with people of your own kind and commiserate. Yeah, I'm the by the Department of Environmental Protection. What did you do? The violation, $1,750. We could hear the music on the street. And meanwhile, if you come up 9th Avenue right now, they're burning tar. You know, I wake up till drilling, 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm playing music. 
and they get here on the street. And, 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 and Seventeen hundred and fifty dollar fine. In nineteen seventy four, seventy five, when when I was at formerly Joe's working with Bigfoot, yeah, the, yeah. someone called up the EPA and claimed that they'd seen Andy's employees dumping fry liquor grease into the sewer grate outside the street, which of course we hadn't done. We all had the same hours. We all suffered a varying degrees from the same forces. After work, we want to hang out, get drunk. Eat generally raw fish or you know humble soul food type stuff. Thousand dollars worth of Toro sushi, man, right here. Oh man, you did well. What do you got here? Foie gras. Oh, excellent. Oh, we take real pleasure in each other's misfortune without holding it against each other. We just that's the way it is. There is a grim pride in cranking out a lot of food, especially when you're 44 years old. Uh, to do a, an evening of 250 dinners and keep up with the, with the kids, there's nothing like that. Then I'm on top of the world. I mean, it's an enormously powerful, evocative medium of food. I don't ever get tired of it. Hmm, I wonder what I'll serve for tomorrow's special.